Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's 12 o'clock. I'm hoping that most people have signed on. Maybe we'll give it another few seconds. Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, this is Neil Heyman from the Southern New York Association. I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar today, which is going to um, carefully examine the COVID-19 New York State Department of Health Infection Control Focus Survey. Um, I thank you all for being on the call. I particularly thank you all for doing what you do every single day. It's, uh, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be able to be functioning and moving forward if it wasn't for what you folks are doing in the facilities and how you folks are taking care of the people who really need that help. And again, I thank you. Um, events move very quickly as we've discovered and for better or for worse, the Department of Health and the federal government, they move quickly too, sometimes maybe too quickly and sometimes they, they do things that they may or may not pull back, but uh, they are very focused now on, on making sure that what, what takes place in the long-term care facilities is, is what they're expecting. So with, with that in mind, um, we here at Southern New York have developed, uh, or have asked actually that, uh, that Leah Matthias um, actually put, put forth a, a set of slides and a bunch of information, which will be guidance. This guidance actually, if used properly, uh, can be used to prepare a facility using the checklist and using the material in the slides, uh, it, can, it can allow a facility to personalize, so to speak, to, to the particular facility that you are in, a, the basics, basics of a manual, which is what the, um, what the department will be looking for should they come for a survey. So what I'd like to do actually is turn this over to uh, Effie Battis from the Audacia Foundation and ask if she would be kind enough to introduce our speaker and the topics and tell you all the, what the procedure for the day will be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. We will uh, quickly begin the, uh, the webinar. Uh, just would like to take a, a brief moment uh, to introduce our, our speaker today, uh, speakers. Uh, first, we have Leah Matthias. Uh, she's the clinical director uh, for the Audacia Foundation simulation program uh, that a uh, number of facilities have participated in. We hope to be resuming that uh, shortly when, um, when acceptable. Uh, we are in the process of putting together some online um, onboarding of new staff and we will be rolling that out shortly to you uh, to help with the, some of the revised regulations with regard to staff that are allowed to be in your building, um, providing uh, various services. So that is something that Leah and her team is working on and uh, we hope to bring that to you soon. Um, so, uh, Leah, as, as many of you uh, know, she has extensive experience, uh, many, many, probably too many years uh, dealing with survey. So this is a topic that she's uh, very familiar with. Um, and we also have with us today, Carmentina to Silvestri Tan, who is board certified in infection prevention and control and who serves as an advisor uh, on the uh, curriculum and will be available to ask questions. Uh, this is now, uh, since I think we've all become comfortable with Zoom, all of the phones are on mute. And uh, if there are questions, we ask that you post them in the chat. They can either be posted to us, the panelists, or to all. And uh, we'll leave time at the end to address them. Uh, also, if there are questions that we can't answer, there is going to be uh, further dialogue with the Department of Health tomorrow uh, to, to get some further clarification on various items related to PPE, infection control, uh, and anything else that isn't uh, able to be uh, answered uh, today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Leah. Thank you. Thank you, Neil and Effie. This is Leah Matias. I will begin the webinar. Um, our objectives for today involve the uh, preparation for COVID-19 infection control focus survey, which would include a review of the policies and uh, related compliance rules. 
uh, and the review of the on-site survey activity and the, um, the COVID-19 focused survey tool. We have a lot to cover. I will peruse some of the highlights, but our intention is to cover, to give you guideline and direction on how to proceed in preparation for this on-site uh, infection control survey focused on COVID-19. So uh, one Friday, uh, the 13th in March, the president declared a national emergency due to the threat of COVID-19 disease, which triggered many modification of the survey process. CMS, of course, at this time prioritized and suspended certain federal and state surveys and delayed some of the uh, revisit surveys. However, they still uh, will come to your facility for complaint visits. Um, they triage those uh, facility complaints that are reported if it may have a potential for immediate jeopardy. Just be aware and once they uh, visit your facility and on-site visit, they may also review your facility for a focused infection control survey related to COVID-19. So, um, so far we are um, feeling all the target infection control surveys. Um, according to reports, there has been uh, more than 35 on-site visits so far in New York State. Um, this focused infection control survey includes streamlined review checklist. Um, this intent is to minimize the impact on provider activities during the time of crisis. So it's very much focused on COVID-19. Uh, it also includes some voluntary assessment tools which will review in depth. Um, there's also a requirement um, that includes system surveillance designed to identify possible infections before they could be spread throughout the facility and when and whom to report. Um, these are the following uh, New York State Department of Health survey focus areas that were mentioned recently um, in the April 13th brief call conference that was just last Thursday. Uh, and this was summarized by Christine Fasiri, uh, uh, manager of special uh, projects for Southern New York. Um, and these are itemized uh, and we will review all these nine items in somewhat detail because it will affect um, your focus in preparing for this survey. Um, many of these items are already familiar to you and should be familiar to you. Any of you, if you've already been working hard to um, coordinate coordinate these activities, such as the visitation restrictions, communications with family members, specifically that it has to be timely, uh, related to newly COVID positive residents and related deaths within 24 hours or as soon as possible. Uh, the required PPE available to staff uh, and maintaining adequate supplies, which is a challenge for all of us. Screening of the staff before each shift, which includes staff who has been working double shifts, and the requirement is that the staff be screened every 12 hours, and we need to keep a, a running log to maintain these screenings. We're also going to review the facility's preparedness uh, and infection control measures, which include policies and procedure, a checklist on hand, um, that is needed to be ready for the surveyor upon entry to your facility. Um, again, we'll review the policy and procedures that are existing and needs to be updated based on the, the most recent New York State Department of Health uh, COVID-19 response and planning. Uh, there has to be itemized plan for isolating, cohorting, symptomatic, and non-COVID resident population. We'll go over that in depth. Um, we're also going to talk about staffing assignments uh, and compliance for when the staff may return to work. So let's get started. 
The first one is the visitation restrictions, which include signage and the policy uh, related to end of life visitations. So restrict visitation of all visitors. The, on the right side is where the letter is, is March 13th, indicating decisions about um, deciding who may be allowed to visit based on a case by case basis related to end of life care. So obviously the care plan here has to indicate the end of life situations for your residents. Um, the restrictions for vendors and um, other agency staff, personnel, transport, um, people who deliver food and equipment. Uh, we must take necessary actions to prevent any potential transmission. Um, so an example is for vendors that transport um, supplies should be, should be dropping their supplies to a dedicated location in the facility such as a loading dock, so that the, the, the healthcare worker could pick up those supplies and deliver to the unit. So it minimizes cross-contamination. So we should already be providing um, some um, pos uh, communication styles, such as phone and video communication for our residents who are feeling alone. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure that the family and the residents have um, available way to contact each other. We may want to assign staff as primary contact to families and offer um, the phone line with voice, re voice recording to be more proactive about the information that's going on um, in the facility. Communications with, with all family members regarding newly COVID positive residents um, and COVID related deaths. Uh, we were criticized by the news um, recently about not communicating in a time manner. The expectation is that uh, on the same day that the facility learns of a suspected or confirmed case of COVID-19, the facility must communicate to the resident and resident's families or significant others. Um, uh, and uh, we should send initial letter or emails regarding COVID-19 residents uh, and to their loved ones outlining infection control policies. policies. We should um, follow up uh, and proactively follow up to call families and speak to the, with the residents in person. We need to maintain uh, routine communication with residents um, via email or other um, platform, electronic platform, FaceTime, um, and be proactive about it. Don't wait for the residents to solicit information. Um, there has to be an intent uh, to be transparent with information related to their loved ones. The third is the required PPE available for the staff. Uh, the facility needs to maintain adequate and accessible supply of gloves, gowns, and masks. Even during um, times of shortage, we need to optimize and conserve these PPE. So these are general guidance re related uh, to uh, PPE, the use of standard contact droplet precautions with eye protection. So what does this mean? We need to have face mask, a gown, and gloves, and eye protection. This is just a reminder that N95 is still uh, a shortage for the supply. Um, N95 respirator and power air purifying respirator is not necessary for routine care. So these type of PPE should be reserved for high risk procedures. So what are high risk procedures? These are the aerosol generating uh, procedures called the AGPs, such as the intubation, extubation, open suctioning, bronchoscopy, nebulizer therapy, and um, sputum induction. A single room is uh, 
with a closed door is recommended. So the, um, the airborne infection isolation room is not required unless the patient is going, uh, undergoing um, AGPs or the aerosol generating procedures. What's most important when uh, preparing for survey, of course, for the optimal care is that the healthcare personnel must have evidence of training and demonstrate an understanding of when, what, and how to use the PPE, which includes sequence of donning, doffing, and how to disinfect the PPE when it's reused or extended use and its limitation. So the next slides is for your information. Um, it's in detail about the CDC strategies for optimizing the supply of the PPE. We will not go through um, all the details in this next few slides, but highlight some important um, issues such as using the PPE for extended use versus reuse. What's the difference? And how uh, and when can we use this option for certain PPE? So some PPE, not all, may be used um, as an extended use or a limited reuse. An extended use means using the same PPE without removing the PPE for each encounter. While reuse or limited reuse means using the same PPE for several patients and encounters, but removing the PPE for each encounter. So the reuse means that the staff may go in with a mask, but before he or she leaves the room, he, he or she needs to remove that mask and then reuse again. So these are outlined and strategies of how to use it for different PPE. Um, certainly the N95 respirators is uh, a very much uh, still a shortage, but what's important to highlight here is the requirement for an initial fit test is still relevant and necessary. However, um, this, there is a temporary suspension for the annual fit test, which was originally required for N95. So OSHA waived the need for an annual fit testing. So the initial fit test is still required. The annual fit testing has been waived. Uh, it's also important uh, to make sure that every time the N95 is uh, put on, it, it needs to be, there needs to be a seal check or a fit test. A fit check, not a fit test, a fit check for every time the N95 is um, done. So eye protection, um, the supplies could be shifted, shifted from disposable to re reusable devices. Um, certainly eye protection could be uh, an extended use for eye protection. Uh, the important part here is uh, making sure that um, there is a reprocessing for the single use um, eye protection, which is the face shield. Um, the last the number six bullet, while wearing the face shield, wipe the inside of the face shield and then the outside of the face shield next with a um, clean cloth saturated with the appropriate disinfected, uh, disinfectant solution. There are also slides regarding conserving gowns. Uh, using isolation gowns as alternatives that offer equivalent or high protection. Uh, we should conserve surgical, surgical gowns for surgical or sterile procedures. Um, some of the other gowns, such as coveralls, um, may be used uh, that uh, the optimum is covering the whole body. 
um, expired gowns. I didn't realize gowns expire, but they have expiration dates. Um, the expiration is waived uh, to be used um, for above and beyond the expiration date, so that's good. Now, when we get to no gowns are available, there, these are a list of uh, gowns that are or alternative use of gowns, such as long sleeve aprons, um, not as pretty, pretty as the yellow gowns, but these are um, alternative uh, to other gowns uh, should the, um, the isolation gowns no longer available. So these are items that you could use, such as um, laboratory, lab, lab, uh, laboratory coats that may be washable or reusable. Be mindful that when you're reusing gowns, um, there will be an increase in laundry operation. So face mask is one of the examples wherein you could um, apply extended use or limited reuse of face masks. Um, certainly, uh, we would, once there's a shortage of face masks, we need to prioritize. And when there are no face masks available, uh, CDC strategies include making a homemade face mask, um, using um, special isolation rooms, um, ventilated headboards, all of these have been somewhat implemented in many settings. Okay, so the fourth item is the screening of the staff before each shift and for those working double shifts at the 12 hour point. So obviously we're going to need a log to maintain these screenings. It's important to separate the log for screening the staff and then a separate log for screening the visitors. So for the staff, all staff must have their temperature taken and be screened for the symptoms for COVID-19, which includes a sore throat. Um, so it's uh, recommended to screen them to start at the start of each shift and every 12 hours. For um, staff, and many of your staff have been working double shifts now, you need to be mindful to make sure that if they're working the second shift, that at the beginning of that shift, a temperature and this, this screening tool is uh, completed. Um, so uh, as a reminder, any staff with a fever greater than 100.0 Fahrenheit uh, with symptoms, uh, the staff at that point should be sent home and immediately referred to uh, your infection uh, preventionist for tracking and trending of um, this uh, potential infection. Okay, and the temperature is 100.0, not 100.4. 100.4 is for the residents. So keeping the log in, uh, of the screening is optimal, especially on the weekends. As I hear, um, the surveyors have, may arrive on weekends. It happened, um, I got feedback from one of the administrators that the surveyor came on site last Saturday. So beware that um, they could come anytime, they could come off shifts as well. So these logs should be readily available, whoever is the designated uh, administrator for that day or that shift. Number five, review of facilities preparedness and infection control measures for COVID-19. So um, we are going to go through this checklist. Um, the intent of this checklist is to assess and improve uh, the facility's preparedness for responding to COVID-19. And that includes rapid identification, considerations for visitors and consultants, supplies and resources, your sick leave policies, education and training, and the surge capacity for staffing. I will go through this more in depth towards the end of our uh, session. 
For um, policies and procedures specific to COVID-19, the policies and procedures need to be facility-wide. Um, facility-wide means it's not just um, known to the administrator or the director of nursing. It needs to be inclusive of all the other departments. Um, uh, the feedback that I received from uh, facilities who has had recent survey is that uh, the surveyors are not accepting of a corporate policy uh, related to COVID-19. So if uh, your facility is part of a corporate um, facility, you must make sure that um, your facility name and specific facility specific standard and policy is identified when you present your facility policy and procedure. They may not readily accept your corporate policy. So um, again, we'll review these parts of infection control uh, related um, items for um, updating your policy for COVID-19. Number seven is reviewing the protocols to separate the residents into cohorts of positive, negative, and unknown, as well as separating the staff teams to deal with the COVID-19 uh, positive residents and non positive residents. If this is not easy to do. Um, this is a movable musical chair when it comes to whether the resident is positive, negative, confirmed, suspected, um, and that, but it's very important to um, make sure that we isolate symptomatic, symptomatic patients as soon as possible have protocols to separate residents into cohorts. Um, the policy needs to be updated, uh, certainly related to uh, residents that should be transferred within the facility or other long-term facility. Um, uh, there has to be policies when in, where in we need, we, you need to transfer those residents because you cannot accommodate their care or provide a, a, an opportunity to cohort uh, these residents. Um, if unable to meet cohorting standards or for any of, um, of these residents, Admission to of this residence must be suspended. Okay, um, the facility is asked to contact the Department of Health at this number to assist to obtain assistance uh, for the appropriate placement of the resident based on their COVID nineteen status. So um, number eight is the procedure for staffing assignments. Now, I know that there's a lot of staffing uh, constraints uh, related to shortage and staff burnout. They've been working for the past eight weeks now, trying to make ends meet for our residents. What's important to highlight under this category is the possibility of providing consistent assignment. So what is consistent assignment? This is not alien to us. Uh, we've been um, promoting consistent assignment in as much as possible, even before this pandemic. Uh, this means that the assignment of staff are consistent for the same staff, same resident, for all residents regardless of the symptoms of COVID-19 status. This is not an easy, uh, not so easy to do, especially during shortage of staff. In any case, we have to uh, do the best we can um, to, um, to provide this assignment in a consistent way because there are many benefits. First of all, it enhances the staff's familiarity with their assigned residents. Um, the staff could uh, anticipate the resident needs, which means they could uh, uh, be able to coordinate uh, the care 
um, and we still need to continue our patient-centered care approach. So consistent staffing in as much as possible is very much um, needed, uh, especially now. Uh, imagine working double shift, all right? So uh, it's reasonable uh, to assign the staff who's already working uh, the next shift or 16 hours on the same unit and with the same residents so that um, a continuity of care could be provided for that resident. The goal uh, for this consistent staffing is to decrease the number of different staff interacting with each resident, as well as the number of times those staff interact uh, with the resident. As much as possible, staff should not work across the unit of floors. So why are we talking about this? There, this needs, there needs to be a policy or a, a verbiage related to um, consistent staffing and the way that we assign staff for um, uh, COVID or non-COVID patients. So the policy should include um, sick leave policies. Um, and uh, with some indication that it is non-punitive and flexible and consistent. Um, uh, the sick leave policies need to be um, made as fair as possible to, to encourage staff to, uh, to be committed to return to work and to provide safe care. For the duration of the state emergency, all long-term facility uh, personnel should wear a face mask while they are in the facility. This also should be indicated in your policy. So let's talk about when is it safe for the staff to return to work? Well, the April 29 uh, Dear Nursing Home Administrator um, letter indicates that the New York State Department of Health um, is um, changing its uh, ruling regarding when the staff should return to work, and which is not uh, quite uh, in sync with the CDC guideline. Um, so New York State Department of Health extend, extended the number of days the, re, the staff may return to work. So employees who test positive for COVID-19 but remained asymptomatic are not eligible to return to work for 14 days from the first positive test date, which is the collection date of the testing. 14 days instead of the CDC's guideline of seven days. For symptomatic employees, um, employees may not return to work until 14 days after the onset of the symptoms, uh, provided that at least three days or 72 hours have passed since the resolution of the fever without the use of fever reducing medication. So there's a, a difference between the CDC guideline, which is seven days, and New York State Department of Health has extended the requirement to um, 14 days. Now, so of course, um, there is a serious implication regarding extended 14 days from as it relates to staffing. Certainly your staff may be out for an extended period of time. So on this letter um, also there is a mention of an online portal to access staff for recruitment of nurses or uh, healthcare workers. So um, there's a lot of discussion uh, with the association to make sure that is um, user-friendly for the facilities. So stay tuned about this portal. So, so let's talk a little bit about the New York State testing protocol, which was updated also uh, last week. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that um, 
Uh, testing may be provided to individuals employed in health, uh, as a healthcare worker uh, or first responder or essential worker who directly interacts with the public while working. Um, so this letter indicates that um, also that the residents with, uh, uh, who is symptomatic and history of symptoms of COVID-19 may now be tested. Um, and certainly uh, individuals who have had close contact um, and other reasons for testing. So it's, uh, there's going to be more open testing. And so they deliver this um, letter to uh, indicate who the individuals uh, or healthcare workers that qualify for prioritization for testing. So um, this is a list uh, that is indicated in that letter of the um, types of personnel that may be tested at this time. Uh, the second list are individual, uh, individuals who are essential employees that um, directly interact with the public while working. Um, so this is not an exhaustive list. So let's get down to the nitty gritty about what we can expect from the uh, surveyors. Um, so um, these are, this is a summary of the COVID-19 focus survey and survey protocol. There are eight requirements on this protocol that is required to be performed by the surveyor when they visit your facility on site. So the first one is that they will limit the on-site team to one or two surveyors. I received feedback that some facilities had three surveyors. Certainly, um, there may be variations on this because like us, this is a new normal for the surveyors. Um, they are also learning this new survey protocol. So it's quite possible to have uh, more than two surveyors and, and another surveyor that may be uh, working offsite in sync with this team. So this is nothing new. Uh, when we were uh, dealing with the flu outbreak that the on-site surveyors will look at hand hygiene practices, the use of PPE and how we discard uh, and remove PPE, the cleansing and disinfection of medical equipment, uh, and uh, effective uh, use of transmission-based precautions. There will be uh, environmental observations. Um, so certainly it's the first thing they see upon entry, the signage at entrances and patients' rooms. The signage needs to be visible at the wheelchair level and uh, it needs to be uh, readily read in, in big scripts. Um, at that point in time, there should be screening uh, of staff if that's their entry, uh, staff at shift change and entrances. Uh, there has to be someone uh, coordinating uh, or limiting uh, the entry of non-essential staff. There should be uh, ready, available, accessible hand hygiene stations. So hand hygiene stations need to be obvious and present at the front and entrance. There will be also um, interviews and review of the policy and procedure. Certainly, um, it will not be the infection preventionist who would be interviewed. Um, they will validate your policy uh, by asking questions uh, off the front line or the caregivers. Normally, it's the CNAs, and many CNAs are the ones who are being interviewed to make sure that there is compliance of the COVID-19 directed uh, policy and procedure to determine the staff knowledge and uh, competency. 
there will be a review uh, of the surveillance, uh, the log of the um, screening of staff and uh, visitors. Um, number five is adhere to all CDC guidance for infection prevention and control related to the COVID-19, which would be, again, uh, a review of your policy to make sure it is updated based on the most recent guidance. Um, during the uh, entrance um, of the surveyor, uh, there will be uh, a request uh, to complete uh, a COVID-19 entrance conference worksheet. And then um, there will also be some um, scheduling uh, of interviews that uh, may be done in person or done uh, by telephone if uh, the team is working with an off-site surveyor. Now, number eight, uh, of course, is the scary one. Uh, but we know this happens um, as they come for this focus survey. Uh, if there are situations that are present that may not be related to COVID-19, but uh, may be considered immediate jeopardy situation, the uh, on-site surveyor will investigate appropriately. So the survey protocol includes an off-site survey process and an on-site survey process, and then a facility self-assessment checklist, which will be provided to the surveyor upon entry to your facility. And we'll talk about that uh, more so in a, after this. So this is the COVID-19 focus survey for nursing home. This is what it looks like. So you could actually read it verbatim and, and print it out to make sure that you've itemized the, all the uh, concerns in your policy and procedure. And it's pretty much self-explanatory. There are some general standard precaution, precautions. There's your hand hygiene uh, procedure. There's your procedure for PPE um, and the transmission-based precautions. Um, we will go through uh, and identify and go through each step um, of what they're looking for upon this focus survey for the nursing homes. So there's no mystery to this. It's already outlined for us in terms of what the surveyor's expectation is on site. And these are the questions that uh, will be asked and we'll go over this uh, in detail. Number one, did staff implement appropriate PPE? Did staff provide appropriate resident care? Does facility have a facility-wide policy and procedure for infection control? Is there an infection surveillance plan? Did the facility perform appropriate screening um, restrictions, education uh, for staff and visitors? Did the facility provide education for the residents and staff and monitoring and screening of staff? Is there an emergency preparedness for staffing in and during this emergency? So number one, take a deep breath because these are completely outlined as a survey focused, which uh, the surveyor or surveyors will be observing and interviewing your staff. One is, did the staff implement appropriate PPE? Despite the shortage of PPE, the requirement is still to take appropriate steps to obtain PPE supplies and optimizing, prioritizing, conserving those PPE. And are staff performing the following um, um, standards appropriately, such as respiratory hygiene, the environmental cleaning and disinfection, and reprocessing of reusable equipment? 
those are cleaning the uh, the reusing of the uh, PPEs. How do you clean it? How do you disinfect it? Do you use the proper um, EPA standard disinfection uh, solutions? Are staff performing hand hygiene? So there are a lot of videos out there about appropriate hand hygiene using an alcohol-based rub or hand washing. It's very important that staff are performing based on the um, CMS requirement or WHO requirement. Um, the appropriate use of PPE. Again, uh, we, we looked in detail about donning and doffing and the sequence of donning the PPE and doffing the PPE. It cannot be arbitrary. Uh, it needs to be donned in sequence and removed in sequence. And especially the your being observed of when the caregiver uh, is discarding this PPE when leaving the room. And does your staff know what an extended use or reuse of PPE and which PPE uh, may be applied for this extended use or reuse? Not all or not all situation can we um, provide this um, procedure for extended use or reuse. Um, next is if we're determining uh, the appropriate transmi uh, transmission-based precautions. For aerosol generating procedures, N95 is required. So when there's a nebulizer in the room, is the staff using goggles, glo gloves, and gown? Um, was this performed in the private room or isolation room? And were the surfaces uh, disinfected uh, promptly? For regarding high touch areas, who's cleaning these high touch areas and what are high touch areas? And who's keeping the list of when it's being cleaned? Um, so other things are, uh, we're doing quite well, I believe, um, about the signage and the postage, uh, posting of PPE and, um, and how the staff is not being monitored for compliance uh, related to this PPE. Uh, certainly, you would want to make sure that you have the lesson plan and attendance record and updates uh, depending in the changes in the recommendation from the CDC and the, the New York State Department of Health. If there are concerns identified with regard to uh, the appropriate use of the PPE, your patient sample will be expanded. So they may stay longer. The second part of the focused observation by the surveyor is the question wherein did the staff provide the appropriate resident care? For COVID-19, were there room restrictions except for medically necessary purposes? If the resident who has uh, confirmed or suspected COVID-19, if obviously the resident is leaving the room for hopefully for important reasons, uh, was the resident wearing a mask, a face mask? Um, there has to be um, efforts made for social dis distancing, uh, which includes the resident distancing. So group outings are canceled. Uh, communal dining is canceled. Uh, with regard to communal dining, so you have to provide alternatives to communal, communal di dining. One would um, need to be mindful of the increased staffing when, in, in, when it comes to providing meals to residents, no longer uh, as a, a group or cafeteria or um, communal dining style. You need to provide uh, more staff for feeding the residents who require more assistance. Um, if the resident is suspected or known COVID-19, a uh, private room needs to be provided. Um, this uh, essential part for hospital transfers, it's important to document if the um, emergency services and the receiving facility is alerted of the COVID-19 status of the resident being transferred to the hospital. 
And also the patient uh, should be wearing a mask during this transfer if tolerated. If not tolerated, please make sure that your care plan indicates why the resident cannot tolerate the face mask. Also, the, one of the hardships for this um, focused observation is related to residents um, who have uh, dementia and ambulatory. It's very hard to keep them in one place, never mind room restrictions, as well as keeping them to wear face mask when they're moving about in the unit. The third is does the facility have a facility-wide infection control standards and policies that are current and based on national standard. As I mentioned, um, the policies have to be facility wide, not corporate wide. If you're using a corporate wide policy, please make sure that you identify the facility specific um, policies related to COVID-19. Even uh, though it may be similar in content of, in, of the corporate policy. Um, it should also include um, policy regarding undiagnosed respiratory illness and COVID-19. So um, when they observe um, behaviors or interviews uh, during the on-site um, on uh, visit, um, the, the practice needs to be co corroborated with these applicable uh, and pertinent policies and procedures. So um, the focus of the surveyor is trying to match what they observed being delivered uh, on site with the resident uh, and match it with your updated policy and procedure. Not easy. So number four, did the facility provide appropriate infection prevention uh, and infection surveillance, uh, indicating the number of residents uh, or staff with a fever, number of residents or staff diagnosed with COVID-19, number of residents or staff tested for COVID-19 and the protocol for testing. All of these items, uh, need to be indicated in the infection control surveillance. Um, what I would like to highlight uh, during the interview is the on-site uh, surveyor will ask the nursing staff how they communicate to the provider, the physician and administrator, when they uh, identify some concerns related to COVID-19 or other respiratory illness. So what does this mean? We need to uh, make sure that our staff are comfortable in relaying how they communicate with the care team uh, related to symptoms of COVID-19. Number five, did the facility perform appropriate screening restrictions and education of visitors? So not only are we screening our visitors, we need to educate our visitors. And that includes instructions for hand hygiene, um, limiting their interactions with other residents and restricting their visits to resident rooms, providing them with the appropriate PPE. Do they know how to put it on and take it off? And how is this communicated? Um, to the, the uh, visitor and the resident. And also, are, they, are the visitors advised to monitor signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and what appropriate actions are taken if after they visited, uh, they, um, um, they, um, they develop uh, respiratory illnesses. These are all and should be covered um, under patient education and family education for visitors. 
Um, did the facility provide appropriate education, monitoring, and screening of staff? So um, these, again, there has to be evidence that education was provided um, for uh, screening and educating the staff. So those sign-in sheets, those lesson plans, those policies, uh, you may want to include uh, evaluation of the training and um, what is also nice is the uh, pre and post test to make sure that there is learning that occurred during that training. <clears throat> um, in, if the staff develops symptoms at work, what does the facility do? Immediately are they provided with a face mask and sent home? Who has the responsibility to send him home? Or are they sitting in the supervisor's office waiting for instructions? Um, how is the infection preventionist informed of this incident right away in order to begin or initiate the tracking of the contacts and the equipment of the symptomatic staff? And um, what guidance are you providing for when the staff may return to work? And so we talked about that earlier in this webinar. You should use that new guidance for returning to work within 14 days, not seven days. Did the facility develop and implement policies for staffing strategies during the emergency? This may be the hardest one yet to prepare. Um, there has to be policy on ensuring staffing to meet the needs of the residents during the COVID-19 outbreak. So you, they will ask number of RNs, LPNs, CNAs per unit, what your staffing ratio is for, for the day shift, evening shift, or night shift, or do you have a 12-hour shift? Um, did the facility implement their planned strategy for ensuring staffing needs? Are you hiring feeding assistants? Are you hiring temporary nurses aides? Do you have sitters now that you don't have um, communal dining or restorative nursing or group therapy or group ADLs? Um, are you providing sitters, feeders? Are they competent? Um, are they educated? Do you have uh, training modules for them? What about uh, staffing for dementia or memory care units? How are you keeping them from cross-contamination? If you have a respiratory care program, your staffing will be much different from um, a regular unit. You have a specialty or wound care unit. What is the staffing look like? Will there be more licensed versus non-licensed? Those are the um, focus of uh, the surveyor. When they come into your facility, those are the questions they're gonna ask. So how should you prepare? prepare? So in the next five minutes, I'll go through a checklist. Um, and then um, uh, after that, we will go through some questions and answers of what I've just discussed uh, in detail in preparing for um, this on-site survey. Uh, so there is a worksheet that I'm going to show you um, to use so that you could prepare um, to provide proof of compliance because that's what the on-site surveyors want. Is there proof of compliance to um, the preparation for COVID-19, uh, preparedness for COVID-19? And these are the um, the areas uh, to identify in this worksheet. So let's go through them. So this self-assessment and voluntary checklist came from CDC. Um, this is modified a little bit. So there is a code uh, on the top to indicate the list of facility proof of compliance. And the proof of compliance, of course, is can your staff be interviewed and articulate what they've learned? Can they demonstrate and be competent and perform those things they've learned? Uh, so that would be some QA check, uh, random or 
uh, complete uh, training of the staff and validating their learning and their practice? Is there an updated care plan that is individualized? For instance, end of life issues, are those end of life issues uh, validated? And what are those? What are your criteria for end of life and determining when end of life is and who's documenting that? Okay, the team, the care planning team has to be coordinated in updating and individualizing this care plan. Uh, the biggie the record of family and patient education and communication with the family. The record of letter sent or phone call to the family who's doing that, who's documenting that attempts were made to call or send a letter and when and what time. Is it timely information? Is it timely phone call? Well, how many attempts did you make? Signage in the front lobby, F is staff education with lesson plan and attendance record, updated related policies that specifically highlight any change in the healthcare personnel responsibilities. Um, infection control line listing with which monitors patient symptoms of infection and also staff infection. The flow sheet for screening should be separate from staff and visitors and patient. Record of cleaning and disinfection. This is a biggie. How do we know that we're cleaning and disinfecting um, high touch surfaces? And what are the high touch surfaces? And what equipment are being disinfected? And what EPA standard disinfection is being used? So this is all this facility Proof of compliance is team-oriented type of compliance. And this grid, allow, grid allows you to prioritize and also demonstrate example of proof of compliance. And with this grid, you could identify your weaknesses or gaps. And we'll go through a little bit about what this entails. So, um, all of the content in this grid we've already discussed. Um, we just need to make sure that you're pulling all the proof of compliance should your on-site um, surveyor um, requires it. And most likely they're gonna start with observations, then interview, and then look over your policies, whether their observation is documented in your policy and vice versa. Um, the next slide is the nursing home COVID-19 preparedness self-assessment uh, checklist version, which is April uh, 10, of April 10. Uh, this is the most recent one, which is almost exactly the content <coughs> of, the, of this uh, modified version. <coughs> so um, you have this tool of checklist that identifies all the things you're already doing and may also identify some of the things you may not completely be sure about whether you're meeting the standard and the requirement. Um, I suggest that you um, bullet these items in your policies or to make sure that each of the content in this checklist is documented and validated and um, that your care team, your residents and your visitors are educated in, 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 the, in these areas. So now I am finished with our webinar. Um, the last slide are all the references uh, that uh, relates to the content of this webinar. So I'm going to ask um, Effie and Carmen, who is also on the line, to um, answer some of our participants' questions. And, um, and this is and this is my webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Uh, we, uh, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, walk us through uh, the guidance uh, and recommendations for facilities. Uh, as we uh, recommended early on, um, encouraging everyone to use the chat box. We do have a question uh, from um, one of the participants. Are there any suggestions for notifying residents of in-house deaths? This is assuming that families and guardians would be notified. 
Uh, yes, I think this is Carmen. Okay, Hi, regarding family, yeah. Um, as Leah mentioned in the slide regarding the family notification requirement, be aware that it is uh, time sensitive whenever there is a resident um, who came back, whose test came back positive, or there is a death. The family or the representative must be notified within 24 hour period. And uh, like, for example, in our facility, we assign a group of staff who will do this part. And uh, these are the physicians, nurses, or the uh, social workers who, of course, they, uh, document if that process had uh, occurred. The question relates to notifying in-house residents. What's the best way to do that? Assuming that the family guardian notification is done. Oh, it's, uh, it's the same uh, process. As uh, Lee had mentioned, uh, as soon as possible, as soon as the result comes back, uh, the residents must be notified of that uh, result. And also whenever they are suspected, you know, without uh, having the result back yet, the uh, resident or patient uh, must be informed of what is going around. No, mm -hmm. but there is, yeah, there is a um, um, mandated requirement for notification of family and uh, representatives within that 24 hour time frame. Right. I think the question is more a nuanced one with regard to um, how the residents uh, will. Uh, uh, perceive or respond to this information. So I guess it's it's more about the ha you know the not the, the if and the when, but but the sensitivity of having to inform other residents about uh, you know this. So are there any recommendations for who is it? Should it be social work? You know how it's done. Uh, yes, uh, any psychological or emotional matters that would arise from the uh, cases, especially the um, death, uh, you know, uh, there is a psychology or psychiatry that we have in-house whom they are always, you know, available for referral of such uh, cases. So uh, in addition to our social worker, physician, you know, it's a, a team effort, as uh, we always say, and if the physician and nurses and social workers, you know, could not classify or, um, you know, uh, not adequately able to calm the residents down, then a psychology and psychiatry, uh, you know, a team could uh, be in the picture too. Is that, uh, did I answer the yeah. question? Okay. Yes. Um, we have another question uh, that came earlier on. Um, why, well, there may not be an answer to this. Why did DOH decide to change the CDC guidelines? And that came earlier on. Um, I mean, that's a speculation, I think. I don't know if anybody wants to try to answer that. Yeah. Everyone is aware that New York State has the most burden of COVID-19 cases, right? So the CDC's uh, maximum requirement of seven days of employees returning to work, I mean, uh, DOH had, uh, I mean, went ahead of that and changed it to 14 days based on the incubation period of the disease, of the COVID-19 disease. You know, the incubation period where in the residents are, you know, carrying this virus is up to 14 days. So if they are returned earlier than that 14 days, they might, there is a high chance that they will be transmitting this to the residents of long-term care facilities. And once that happens, you know, there will be a widespread transmission within a resident to resident, staff to staff, you know, and again, highly likely that the mortality rate, you know, will um, increase. So yes, you know, um, pre preventing the transmission of COVID-like virus to COVID-19 virus from healthcare workers who probably are still carrying the virus within this 14-day period. 
you know, uh, that's why the DO, uh, New York State DOH had changed it and uh, went to the maximum uh, days of uh, 14, 14 days. This is Neil Heyman, just, just to kind of add a little, I guess, uh, political commentary to that. New York State was rolling along with the CDC guidelines until at one of Governor Cuomo's briefings, people started questioning whether or not they were good or not. And uh, the, the governor discussed it with his, uh, exec, with his um, commissioner, Zucker, and they decided what was just said is probably the safest way to go. But it hadn't been brought to their attention until it was asked by a newspaper reporter during one of the uh, briefings. Mm, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, oh, I guess there is one question. One of the challenges is assigning dedicated staff to the infected unit. Isn't it also unfair for individuals to constantly be assigned to that unit? Uh, you know, CDC and uh, New York State DOH had clearly recommended to assign specific staff to positive cases because, again, of the fact that the transmission will highly likely happen if they are assigned to mixed cases of positive and negative and presumed cases. And we know it's unfair, but given the right education, the right training, the right guarding of the correct PPE sequencing and things like that, um, you know, a uh, staff who is well knowledgeable to protect themselves will most likely, you know, will not, of course the risk is, will always be there, but the risk will be much, much lower if the staff is well versed and well knowledgeable of on how to take care of residents with COVID, you know, COVID nineteen disease. But uh, there is a written, you know, and clear recommendations of designating staff to uh, each case. Unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, uh, that is uh, what we have to abide by and scientifically based and evidence-based uh, practices, even uh, before COVID-19 had arrived, uh, that's been the recommendation in assigning staff to cases who are on isolation placement. So more so with this, you know, uh, COVID-19, this is that is a highly trans transmissible type of, uh, you know, virus. Uh, two questions. Is there a place we can get a copy of the policy of the COVID-19 just mentioned? Um, uh, yes, we can use the, as we had mentioned, we can use the general uh, checklist on how to prepare our facilities for um, coming of COVID-19. And just to reward uh, you know, change uh, wordings there that should be applicable to, you know, to each uh, facility. Here's another question we might need clarification on. Any chance on 14 days after positive for seven days? You mm. know, uh, <laughs> what uh, Neil probably can add something to this, um, you know, question. We heard about cases that persons who recovered from COVID-19 again had reinfection after several weeks or what. So uh, yes, I mean, they are uh, cases reported like that, that they had relapsed and again had uh, reinfected with, uh, with the same virus. Sorry, my microphone was muted. Uh, okay, uh, the problem with the staff. All right, um, we, 
These two particular questions about uh, the checklist, we can get those to the individual that's asking, as well as um, follow-up questions uh, with regard to staff um, testing positive after the uh, 14 days um, uh, of uh, quarantine. So um, if there are any other questions, um, feel free to ask them or uh, to reach out to us. Um, everyone uh, knows uh, that we're reachable by email um, as well as on our cell phones. So uh, we encourage all members to do so, to reach out to us uh, with any follow-up questions um, or, or comments regarding uh, this specific uh, process. And we will be providing a copy of this presentation as well as a recording of the webinar. And with that, I want to thank uh, Leah and Carmen uh, for being with us today. And uh, we, will, we will be in touch uh, again soon, obviously, as uh, information changes or there are new developments. And thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.